Uh, Sarcopotherium spinosum from mosaic structure to matrix, impact of calcrete nari on vegetation in a Mediterranean semi-arid landscape. This study was uh, conducted in cooperation with uh, Yelena Zhevlev and Tal Svoa, you all know him from here. The study area is in the Judean foothill in central Israel under Mediterranean uh, semi-arid uh, condition. The surface of the slope is characterized uh, by two main structures, non-rocky and uh, rocky. The profile on, of the non-rocky uh, structure is characterized by a thin a soil a layer, about 30 centimeters, that over the chalky bedrock, while the rocky uh, structure is characterized by calcrete, calcrete uh, rocky outcrop, alternating uh, with soil pockets uh, that reach a uh, depth of uh, about one meter. Field survey was conducted, and uh, measurement on five main components uh, 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 was done. Uh, ROC SP, which is uh, the acronym of Sarcopotherum spinosium, in English Tony Barnett, um, common the dwarf shrub in the area. Shrub annual soil were measured uh, as well. What is the relationship between the surface component? Um, according to Pearson, uh, test, the strong correlation uh, was found between ROC and SP. What is the relationship between SP and ROC? It is an invert relation. When ROC is less than 14% of the surface, the SP becomes a dominant component covering 37 up to 80% of the surface. What is the effect of ROC uh, on this uh, surface pattern. The rocky uh, structure is characterized by mosaic structure, while the non-rocky is characterized by SP matrix structure. Here you can see the mosaic uh, rocky uh, structure, and here you can see the matrix on the non-rocky uh, surface, uh, which with a dense cover of uh, SP, with coverage of 80% of the surface. Uh, we suggest that the, dif the, the different vegetation pattern may be related to different water condition on the two surfaces. On the non-rocky surface, there are low uh, runoff and low water condition, while uh, in the rocky uh, surface, water conditions are enhanced due to the presence of rock outcrop, which acts as a source for runoff generation. The runoff is absorbed in the soil pocket, uh, which acts as sink. And all this allow for a higher vegetation to be established. Conclusion. Non-rocky surface uh, has low water condition, which is uh, sufficient to the establishment of a SP, which is adapted to a relatively drier condition in a matrix uh, pattern. The rocky surface uh, has enhanced water condition, uh, which allow the establishment of vegetation uh, that is less adapted to drier condition to be in a mosaic pattern. And final conclusion, rock and SP are interchangeable surface components as both stabilize the surface and enhance the ecological conditions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Yardena. You're invited to the poster session. Um, my name is Yardena Raviv and I'm a research scientist at the Division of Environmental Sciences in Israel at the in, um, Israel Institution for Biological Research. I'm not a biologist, I'm more of a physical chemistry, um, statistical mechanics. Um, I will uh, present uh, our uh, work in uh, the poster, it will be about, um, I will present a lattice Boltzmann uh, calculation and some particle image uh, velocimetry measurements that uh, Uri Shavit has uh, presented earlier of a turbulent flow within above and within a finite and a simplified a finite model canopy. Um, the PIV measurement, as I, as I mentioned, was done by, uh, in the group of Uri Shavit, Sharon Molchanov, and uh, Tomer Duman, which is here also, and we'll present another poster, different one. Um, the motivation of the work comes from the need at uh, IIBR for some input information of velocity and velocity field and uh, statistical uh, information about the turbulence 
in the atmospheric boundary, boundary layer, in the lower one, for transport and evaporation models. Now, this type of information is a very costly one. Um, it's very difficult to calculate it, and, it's a, and it could be very time-consuming. And since we want to keep our models quite simple and use them as risk assessment models, we're looking to simplify our velocity models. And this was basically the aim in this work. So in the poster session, I will present the model equation, the space and time average navier stokes equation that we solve. Um, the model is uh, formulated in a, in a quite general way. It includes uh, turbulent closures that start from Prandtl type of mix, mixing length uh, models all the way, which can expand into LES models, which are more heavy, and we don't want to get there, at least not now. And um, I will present the a canopy drag approach that we use that could be applied for cities and for what, which depends basically on the underlying morphological information that uh, incorporates the canopy. Um, I will also present a new, in the poster session, I will also show uh, the method we use, which is kind of new to us at least, or also in the community of uh, computational fluid dynamics which is a lattice Boltzmann a type of a equation that we solve in order to, to solve the, uh, the flow dynamics, the model uh, that we uh, formulated. Um, I will explain why we use the uh, lattice Boltzmann equation and not the regular type of a, a, a numerical solver, CFD solvers. Uh, I will present the PIV model ma mainly to validate the results we obtain and also to get some information about the statistics to simplify our modeling. Um, in the result section, I will talk about the validation of the model in general. I mean, to try and understand what can we get from that model once we formulated it and compare some results to homogeneously fully developed uh, flow and uh, to uh, some preliminary results to the developing region. And um, from our very preliminary studies of the lattice Boltzmann solution, we have tried to uh, formulate and solve it without any turbulence in it, just to have viscosity. And there we could do a full solution uh, using the lattice Boltzmann method. And this, this is just to give you an idea of what type of, um, of simulation we could get to. And this is much easier than solving a turbulent model. But this was just a an idea of what type of solution we're looking for. Uh, I'm showing here only a little part of the canopy. There are two canopies with a gap between them, and you see the full dynamics with the full uh, boundary uh, conditions, and this is something that, well, I'll present in the poster as well. That's it. Thank you. So the work I'm presenting is a modeling approach for simulating rainfall runoff process in the semi-arid region ecosystem. And this work is done with the help of Xiaoyi, Tao, and Shimo. And you already heard something of the modeling result from uh, Tao and uh, Shimo's talk. So the purpose we want to do this is because that we want to see some uh, spatial and temporal details of how uh, rainfall generate runoff and uh, distribute the water across the uh, area system, uh, ecosystem. So we have a study site uh, very close to here. And uh, there's a plot of uh, uh, about 20 meter by 4 meter. So the, the approach we developed is including uh, two dimensional uh, surface runoff module, which we use the two-dimensional diffusion wave to simulate. And this mo module can give us some uh, spatial and temporal details of how a runoff is uh, uh, moving, flowing across the land surface and uh, uh, provide water to, to the vegetation. And uh, there's, uh, uh, we, we have uh, a two-layer infiltration model, which uh, was developed recently by Smith and other people. So uh, the, the major complexity we are trying to deal with, including the seal layer, uh, uh, microtopography, and uh, vegetation. So this two-layer system uh, infiltration model can give us the power to, to simulate the, the uh, water infiltrate in the sealed 
soil profile. So, of course, uh, the model involves some tedious uh, uh, numerical treatment. And after de uh, developing the model, we validate the model with some uh, uh, analytical solution, hypothetical case, and, and uh, observed data. So the model performs well. And after that, we try to see some uh, fundamental mechanism from the modeling result. To do this, we compare the, the natural condition with a series of uh, uh, hypothetical cases. Uh, the purpose we try to do this is try to single out the, the impact of each critical component of the system. So this is some uh, modeling result for, for infiltration. And we have also have other modeling results which can be seen in, in my poster. So the major finding, including uh, a few major bullets, and one is the, the seal layer and the, the, the vegetation are the major control of the, of the uh, rainfall runoff system. If you miss one of them, you, you won't be able to get uh, the correct uh, result of the runoff. And micro topography can control how water moves toward the uh, plant and provide water to the plant, but it doesn't uh, affect the total runoff too much. And uh, more excitingly, uh, we found that uh, uh, for individual vegetation patch, uh, the vegetation can receive much more water than the local rainfall can provide, up to 10 times of, uh, of the local rainfall can provide. So that's the yeah, thing. Thank you. Um, although I only have four minutes, I would like to thank uh, uh, my uh, PhD students, my former PhD students, Emmy Lammertsma and Hugo de Boer, who did uh, most of the work on stomatal optimization. And of course, we do know is that stomata are extremely important in the carbon and the water cycle. And so they take up the CO2 and they lose, lose the water. And we also do know is that um, they have a dynamic adaptation. Eh? Within seconds or maybe minutes, they can adapt to the, uh, to the environment. But what we also do know is that they can structurally adapt to, uh, to changes, for instance, to CO2 uh, change. And now the question is, can they change that within years to decades? And uh, how far can they change within the so-called phenotypic plasticity? And we uh, try to understand this with the uh, optimality theory, not about uh, maximization of entropy, but we try to maximize our carbon cane uh, with uh, the minimum loss of water. So um, this, this are pictures from um, typical, um, um, uh, a typical species. So you see a, a clear difference in stomatal density. Uh, but we wanted to know um, have much more information on that. So we um, collected huge amounts of herbarium material over the past 150 years. And also we uh, went to the field to uh, collect sediments, to collect peat layers with leaf fragments in there. So, and for every layer and every herbarium material, we try to um, uh, calculate the amount and density of the stomata. And from that we can calculate the st maximum stomatal conductance. And we did that for eight different species, and surprisingly, they all have a clear decrease of about 40% on average uh, at CO2. So within 100 ppm difference, we see a decrease in stomatal conductance of about 40%. And uh, with our canopy models, we think that in energy-limited systems, this will reduce transpiration in for about 30%. And of course, in water-limited systems, we see an increase in biomass in that. And um, one of the things is, now, um, do we have different strategies with, between the species? And can, does it have uh, competitive advantage? And for that, we also went to the same, uh, same period as uh, Danny said, to the Cretaceous, because the Cretaceous had this enormous shift in CO2 from 2,000 ppm suddenly to 200 ppm. And um, we also see at the same time the so-called angiosperm revolution. So the board leaves were coming up and the conifers were going down in amount. And uh, at the same time, we see also that stomatal conductances was, were increasing and also the vein density was increasing. So we think that we need to connect that. So we, 
it's not a matter that we only need to look to the stomata, but also to the, uh, to the whole system, the, the water transport system in the leaves and maybe even through the whole system. And uh, that's what we call the hidden cost of transpiration. So finally, if you, we ha will have a closer look to the difference between a conifer so, and, uh, and a board leaf, then we see that the conifer has a central vein in there and um, the water transport costs are always the same. So it doesn't matter where you put the stomata, the water transport length is always the same. But for a board leaf, they can change their structure, change their fin density, and also change their um, stomatal uh, in between. And that's why we think that uh, during low CO2, the board leaves had a certain uh, advantage uh, because of a much efficient way of uh, dealing with our water. But for all the uh, details, you can have a look to uh, the post. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to present the work I'm doing at Duke University with Gabi Catul, uh, supported by Bard, and it deals with uh, dispersion of particles in the atmosphere, in canopy flows, and specifically in a property which is the dissipation rate, turbulent dissipation rate, which is uh, the loss of energy in the small scales from turbulent kinetic energy to heat. And, and when we talk about dispersion in atmosphere and in canopy flows, uh, usually models that do relate to dissipation, which is actually the mechanism that uh, uh, use the, that uh, makes the dispersion itself, uh, usually these models use just a mean value of the dissipation, and measurements show that the dissipation is changing in time, uh, something like the uh, figure you see on the left top side, and uh, it has a pattern of small bursts of dissipation in small, in short events of time, and this uh, is, uh, behaves like a distribution, a heavy tail distribution, uh, which is a log normal, and this has been shown before in atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, we use measurements in canopy flow in pine forest and show it behaves exactly the same. And when you want to incorporate such property inside flows, usually the classical models, as I said before, doesn't use the time uh, dependent dissipation, but just the mean value, and this cannot cannot uh, actually show all the physical meaning of what's happening uh, of particles that are released inside canopies and, and other atmospheric flows. And in order to incorporate this property inside models, uh, we use trajectory models, which are what's beautiful about these models, that they don't need any uh, empirical uh, parameter, just the flow variables, the flow statistics. And when we incorporate the time-dependent dissipation, we just add one equation, a stochastic equation, and when we uh, examine this model, we, s we see that the addition of this equation just needs one parameter, which is the standard deviation of the distribution, the log normal distribution, and this is something we show for measurement that we can calculate it. We take the measurements and show that we know the standard deviation, it's just a number because it's a normalized uh, distribution. And this ad addition of to, to trajectory models uh, has an implication on sea dispersal and footprints which are very sensitive to uh, dissipation inside canopies especially. So in order to show what's happened when we add this uh, property, the dissipation inside uh, the model, the easiest way to show it is using, oops, let's see if I can do it. It should be a small animation. Okay, we see that we use a continuous source. We use a uh, float statistic from second order closure models. And we release particles within the canopy of a height HC. And we see that the addition of the model of the dissipation, time dependent dissipation, on the lower part of the of the screen, actually 
makes more dispersion. You see the red line, you see more particles ejecting outside near the source and going inside the high velocity above the canopy. And as an effect of this, we see that uh, uh, the concentration of particles here uh, inside the canopy in the lower part of the screen is, le is less than on the upper part of the screen. So that's what the model actually does. And this has a lot of uh, implication, as I said, for dispersal of particles and seeds and also for gases like CO2 and H H2O. And if you want to see more, you're more than invited to see the poster in the session. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this poster was, in fact, designed during the coffee break to follow directly upon the conversation we just had. It builds on an idea towards adaptation for the future. Um, and the idea, I'll present it to you uh, very, very briefly. Please come visit me at, and us at the poster. The idea is around the concept of what sorts of eco-hydrologic adaptations are going to be needed in the future to deal with the fact that uh, forests are in, under stress. Start with the observation that will be of no news to anyone in this room, that forests consume an enormous amount of water in the form of transpiration. And in fact, the amount of water consumed nationally in the US uh, roughly, uh, roughly represents about 25% of the total uh, US uh, ET. Most of it is transpiration, as a recent paper in uh, Nature just pointed out. And it's, uh, it's a very large volume. It eclipses the uh, runoff of, of major rivers. You start with the fact that forests consume a lot of water as transpiration. And when this water demand is not met, they suffer. And they suffer from a variety of mechanisms, uh, dieback, mortality, uh, fire, uh, in, uh, invasion by uh, bugs, and species transformations, all of which can be, in large part, uh, trace back to water stress as a dominant mechanism. So what this implies is that we may need to be rethinking our management of forest lands, specifically from the standpoint of how to maintain forest health uh, through uh, making more water available or making the water that is available uh, last longer for the purposes of, of vegetation. This is not the current paradigm. And if you, uh, at least in the United States, I don't know about Israel, uh, the, the dominant paradigm is much more that forests produce water for thirsty people downstream. Uh, but this is, uh, as we know, hydrologically uh, a myth. Um, so then the question is, what could we actually do? And that's really what the poster is about. Uh, what are the, the kinds of things, that w strategies that one might use to actually make water last uh, more, more available for, for vegetation? The variety of strategies. We have a long list. These are just a few of them, uh, creating gaps of different geometries, thinning uh, to, to uh, increase the amount of soil moisture, uh, snow accumulation, uh, changing the way snow accumulates, changing the way it melts, redesigning roads which transform uh, slow uh, subsurface flow into quick flow. How do we redistribute that back onto the landscape? Managing species to minimize uh, water uptake, mulching uh, forest floors, mulching snowpacks, um, or even uh, going so far as direct irrigation, which actually has been uh, accomplished here in Israel. So there are a variety of strategies uh, that uh, potentially could have an impact. The magnitude of this impact, I think, is very much an open question. And we are using uh, some of the models that uh, uh, Christina Tag, in particular, uh, our co-author, is uh, uh, using Rhesus as a way of testing alternative hypotheses about what could or could not keep trees above uh, water stress uh, and, and mortality thresholds. But what I would like to leave you with is this idea that this is a wide open area. We do not yet understand. We've never directed our research at the question of how we might uh, manage forests specifically uh, to increase water availability for vegetation. We don't know uh, how effective these strategies would be, how they could be accomplished on, the lar on a large enough scale, what unintended consequences might apply to using these strategies in terms of uh, uh, plant uh, interactions. Uh, and so it's a very exciting area, and it's one that uh, I hope you'll come learn a little bit more about at the poster at the end of the hall. Thank you. Thank you. One, please.
Okay, so what my poster addresses is a fundamental physics problem, which is applicable to soils and uh, sediments, which is uh, the invasion of a gas into a water-saturated medium, granular medium. Sorry. So I'm addressing the invasion of a gas into a water-saturated granular medium, for example, a sediment, and that has implications to invasion of air, for example, from above in aeration or drying, evaporation, or from below, if you think of CO2 or methane, uh, perturbing and uh, invading uh, water-saturated medium. And you can see in the center there a movie of uh, hilly chaussel packed with glass beads. And you can see that at the bottom, because of the viscosity contrast, you see what you would expect, ordinary fingering. But at the very top, you see that the formation of this matrix of this granular material, which is a special type of uh, deformable porous media, leads to this pore opening and invasion by, again, overcoming the mechanical force of the whole the matrix together. So this is what I will address. And to investigate, again, the fundamental physics of that, we stayed with kind of ideal systems. Experimentally, we used glass beads saturated with water, and then we injected air. And excuse me, but I, I did this uh, in a rush, so I forgot to include uh, my collaborators there, uh, Ruben Juanes and Mike Sulczewski from MIT. So apologize on that. So we came up with uh, an experimental system which everything is controlled or as much as you can besides the packing of the granular media. So you pack a thin layer of glass beads saturated with water and then you inject air at the center and observe the invasion pattern with the camera, controlling the confinement, how strongly confined is this kind of sediment proxy and of course the injection rate and the type of the size of the beads. And numerically we came up with a simple post numerical model, a completely mechanistic model that accounts for capillarity, capillary invasion, the invasion dynamics, the viscosity of the water, the dissipation of the pressures, which you can see at the bottom right corner. And more, most importantly for this two-way coupling between the flow and the deformation, the effect of these high pressures that again push the particles aside, and I will show you a slide uh, for that in a second. And the, the, the feedback from this deforming, deforming matrix allowing the invasion to occur. So this is a highly nonlinear dynamics problem. And what we found is that you have three modes of gas invasion. The first two are quite familiar, quite uh, known for some time, of course, the viscous fingering and capillary fingering. But the third capillary fracturing is again caused by pore opening or by matrix deformation. So I inject here air from the left into water that are on the right. You see the meniscus uh, advancing there as I increase the air pressure. And these are glass beads, about 150 micron glass beads. And eventually what happens is in this case, because the particles are so small, the capillary pressures are very high and because of the high capillary pressures, the high pressure jump across the interface, these particles are pushed apart, the throat or the, these constrictions is enlarged and invasion occurs by pore opening by matrix deformation. So this is the mechanism. And to get a quantitative handle on that, we did some scaling analysis and we came up with two dimensionless groups, two dimensionless numbers that governs completely the, the behavior and allows to predict the mode of invasion. And these are the modified capillary number, this capillary star, which is the ratio between viscous and capillary forces. It includes the classical capillary number, the in injection rate, the interfacial tension, and the viscosity, but also the system size and the heterogeneity, which was not accounted uh, before quantitatively. And that controls the type of fingering. And more excitingly, the fracturing number, this NF, which is the tendency of the matrix to fracture due to these high capillary pressures. And that includes inter interfacial tension uh, and the mechanical aspects of the system, the friction between the particles, the elasticity, and the weight W, the confinement. So as you can see on this phase diagram at the bottom, you see that you get this fingering type at the very top when you have the fracturing number much larger than one, which means that the fracturing driving forces dominate. 
and you get these fracture looking patterns. And when the, the fracturing number is much lower than one, then the system behaves as a rigid media, then the mechanical stabilizing forces are much larger than this pressure gradient at the, at the meniscus at the front. And then you get ordinary fingering, which as you can see, depends. So as you can see at the kind of shaded area there, the transition again depends on the modified capillary number. So just two dimensionless numbers which are completely defined by the system properties. There's no adjustable, par adjustable parameters. You can predict the behavior. And that, even though this is kind of a poor scale study or a core scale study, this uh, will have implication that that goes back to the question that was asked uh, by Ignacio before. What are the implications for larger scales? So this kind of mode of invasion allows very efficient mass and energy transfer relative to just ordinary percolation. And therefore, I believe that that should be accountable, uh, that should be accounted even for global mass and energy balance because again, it just allows much more rapid transfer. And this, by the way, has nothing to do with the injection velocity. This is not hydrofracture. This can occur at negligible injection rates. Just because of the capillary pressures, you suddenly have this opening, and then you can transmit a lot of, and this is what caused the methane vents and a lot of other phenomena. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My uh, name is Delia. Um, I'll be presenting a poster on below canopy evaporation and the implementation of variable boundary condition in Hydrus 2D. Uh, we have done a number of measurements in a vineyard in a desert area. There's a picture over there. Um, it's a very isolated area, very dry. And in areas like this, evaporation and evapotranspiration can be a very large component of the water balance. So as I just said, it's an isolated drip irrigated desert vineyard. So you have very uh, distinct wet and dry areas. You have very distinct shaded and non-shaded areas as well, as you can see on this picture. So you have both below ground and above ground. You have very distinct patterns that control evaporation. And because you have these canopies that kind of hang in the air, you have uh, a lot of soil that's completely exposed. So our question is, um, how do we quantify this uh, under these conditions? So we did several 48-hour uh, campaigns where we measured hourly evaporation with microlysimeters, as well as some of the potential um, components using micro pens, which are basically lysimeters with water in them, and uh, solar radiation with pyranometers. And then we compared these results with uh, hydrous uh, modeling, we are still in the process actually of, of trying to uh, validate that. And so Hydrus has, uh, calculates evaporation uh, based on, on two things. One is the, uh, the soil's uh, capability to move water to the surface and the other is the potential at the surface. So what we try to do is with this spatial variation in potential, uh, give the hydrus those inputs and see if hydrus is able to um, calculate differences in evaporation below the vine and, and, and see the spatial differences. So this particular graph is showing the results from underneath the vine, directly underneath the vine, um, over, a over a day. And the green line is the measured with the micro images, and you see a dip in the afternoon showing that with the shading uh, that actually affects evaporation. And then we, we, uh, we are modeling this with hydras, and um, the pattern is not exactly the same. We do see uh, similar magnitudes, but if anybody has some input on this, you're more than welcome to come visit us at the poster and talk about this some more. Thank um, you. Sorry. Sorry. So our main message is we see that with these pen, these micro pens, we can um, see variation below the vines. We see that the drip with drip irrigation that is normally presumed to be very uh, efficient, we still have about 10% uh, evaporation of evapotranspiration 
on days without irrigation and the hydras 2D, we are not able to get the diurnal patterns yet, but we do get a reasonable magnitudes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Yair. Um, I'm a student of uh, Professor uh, Ehud Meron in the physics department. And um, I want to ask the question, how can I bring a um, system from a ba bare soil solution, as you see in the top of the um, picture here, to a state where we have some vegetation? Um, I want to accomplish that by um, forcing my um, system per periodically in space. Um, I think that yesterday we saw many pictures of um, systems that naturally uh, present um, patterns and these patterns have uh, a characteristic um, uh, length scale to it, to them, and um, we see some pictures above. There are different kind of um, patterns that we see above and um, my question is, what happens to a system that um, naturally um, tends to form patterns when we force it periodically in space with a different uh, length scale than, than its own? So below you see a tractor, on the left you see a tractor, it's building um, a periodic modification in the topography. It's building um, parallel um, lines uh, on the hill slope along which uh, trees are planted as you can see in, on the right side. And um, what's the interplay between uh, the different um, uh, length scales of uh, the system, the natural uh, length scale of the vegetation system and the uh, forcing length, uh, length scale. Um, I have a vegetation model a simple vegetation model. I can explain it in detail uh, to those who come see me. And um, I, through uh, analysis and simulation, I can get uh, different kind of solutions. Um, in, the, um, in a specific point in the parameter space, I can say that um, there is um, multiple stability of states. Um, specifically, uh, multiple stability between a bare soil solution and pattern, pattern states. Um, on the figure, you see a um, stripe solution that I find. Um, these, uh, the simulations uh, that I show on the right were accomplished by uh, taking this uh, vegetation system and forcing it uh, in space. I, um, I could accomplish that by forcing the topography, uh, the landscape, as you saw in the pictures. But in this case, um, I chose to break the crust um, uh, on the soil uh, periodically in order to change the infiltration rate. And you see that um, for the same parameters um, uh, I can get uh, different kind of solutions, namely um, bare soil solution, which I don't show it here, uh, stripe solutions that um, for every one uh, stripe of forcing um, I can get one stripe of uh, vegetation. And um, above, we can see a two-dimensional uh, pattern, more interesting. Um, it's, uh, it looks like a, a hexagonal pattern. Um, on the right side, you can see a Fourier transform. And I can uh, talk in uh, detail about uh, these patterns. Um, this is an uh, ongoing um, project. And um, I'll be delighted to explain it to you in detail and hear your uh, suggestions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Noah. I go to school here, uh, but in Zdeboker, in the Jacob Blaustein Institute for um, Desert Research. And my poster topic is the effect of land cover change on rain rainfall runoff relationships. And we studied the um, you know, Kona Elon watershed in central Israel. And um, well, we all know that um, changes both in land cover and uh, <clears throat> uh, climate change are most likely to, to, to affect uh, runoff in watershed scales. And uh, so that's why we uh, chose both these components. And we wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, understand the land cover changes in a time frame of 20 years uh, in a sub-basin scale within the Yerkonolon watershed. 
and then use these uh, land cover change findings um, along with an extreme rainfall data in order to understand how these land cover changes have or have not affected runoff in, in this watershed. And so this is a study site, the Conal Aeron watershed, which is located in central Israel. It's about uh, 1,800 square kilometers. And uh, it's the most densely populated watershed in Israel, um, which is partly, mainly the, the reason we chose this area. And so we used the kinematic runoff and erosion model uh, in order to um, answer our, our questions. And uh, we see that, uh, we do. Uh, these are the inputs for the model. Um, the, um, the classification map represented the, the, the different land cover, uh, <coughs> the land covers in uh, two, two different uh, time periods. And we also used um, soil moisture index and uh, special inter interpolation of precipitation data, soils, so a soil map, and of course uh, DEM. And after calibrating the model, uh, we used, um, I'm sorry, I haven't mentioned it, but we used a JS interface, which is the um, AGWA2 um, automated geospatial watershed assessment tool. And after a calibration, uh, the results we get are, are some more, but we chose to, <coughs> to, to stick to runoff dis discharges, mainly peak, peak discharges and runoff volumes. And so we ran this model twice, once on a 1989 Landsat model and after that on a 2009 Landsat model with all other parameters staying the same. And so uh, the results we get, um, we, we then validated them against uh, the 1989 um, uh, storm event and um, conducted some temporal and spatial analysis. And what we uh, derived uh, from this is that um, some, of course, there were land cover changes, and uh, these included uh, a really large, some of the uh, sub-basins uh, decrease in agricultural land and in, um, in um, um, natural covered area in favor of residential cover and uh, residential related processes. And um, these, these land cover changes um, in five out of six sub-basins generated um, increase in uh, runoff volume and peak discharges. And the land cover changes, of course, that had the largest impacts were those that had to do with urbanization and vegetation removal. And especially, we found that uh, vegetation cover had the most uh, effect on runoff volume, uh, volume values. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Koen Siter. I work at uh, Utrecht University with uh, Max Rietkerk and uh, many others, as you can see. Um, so I'm working on two projects now. One is about uh, booster balloon, uh, for people who know what it is. And the other is about uh, this question. So how will uh, increases in rainfall intensity affect patterned arid ecosystems? So what's the thing in, uh, in arid ecosystems that you, there are uh, positive feedback loops uh, hidden in the system, and uh, these po uh, positive feedback loop loops they uh, play a role in uh, regular pattern formation. So here you see uh, an image uh, of uh, banded vegetation in uh, Sudan, but you can find it uh, on any edge of any desert. And uh, the other thing with positive feedback loop is positive feedback loops is that uh, they can result in alternative stable states. So that means that for the same set of environmental conditions you can have uh, a desert state but also a patterned uh, healthy state. And um, if for example the mean rainfall uh, changes, uh, this may result in a collapse of the system or uh, if it increases in the uh, recovery of the system. Um, so what's the problem we're studying? That's, uh, that's in for the coming uh, decades, the intensity of rain events is uh, projected to increase. So that's especially significant in the shaded areas in the left figure. Um, but it happens all around the globe. And the thing is that uh, the partitioning of rainwater into uh, infiltration and water available for plants. And uh, surface runoff is controlled by this rainfall intensity parameter. 
Um, so the question that we want to answer is what happens with the patent arid ecosystems uh, if rainfall intensity increases? So uh, in the current models, uh, the partitioning of rainwater uh, is uh, only implicitly captured. And uh, so that's why I made a new uh, model based on an old model of, uh, of MUX. Um, and I put uh, explicit event-based uh, rainwater partitioning in there. Um, and I kept it uh, simple so that I can do things uh, analytically. Um, so this is uh, one of the results. So here I plotted uh, on the y-axis uh, uh, annual rainfall and on the x-axis uh, the mean rainfall intensity. And you can see that there are four uh, parameter regimes. We, uh, we can have uh, uniform vegetation, you can have uh, deserts, and you can have uh, biostability between a uniform vegetated state and a desert, or a patent state and a desert. And uh, so recovery from the desert uh, will occur at uh, this upper line, and collapse of the system to a desert state can occur at this bottom line. Um, and in between, the system is uh, bistable. And the nice thing is that I could, was able to find uh, expressions for these two lines, or at least estimates of uh, these lines. Um, so what did we find? We found that at uh, low mean rainfall intensities, uh, no patterns uh, occur, and that uh, the system is not bistable. And that with increasing rainfall intensity, uh, the region of bistability increases in terms of uh, annual rainfall. And, uh, well, of course, that if mean rainfall uh, rates, uh, like uh, annual rainfall rates, uh, decrease, then you can fall into the desert state. But the same can happen if the mean rainfall intensity increases. So that's because of uh, increased uh, runoff losses. Um, but also if the mean rainfall intensity decreases, and that's because more water will infiltrate into the uh, bare areas, and uh, that results in uh, water that's not avail available for plants and that's percolated or evaporated. So if you're curious, uh, please visit my poster. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Naomi Tag, although I publish under Christina and I answer to both just to avoid, just to make things confusing. So I am the, one of the principal developers of a model called RESIS, which is a fully coupled um, terrestrial hydrology and carbon cycling model. It's also spatially distributed, and, and we play with different ways of representing the kind of fill and spill routing topologies that Jeff was talking about, and then being able to look at how do our different assumptions about how water moves in the landscape affect vegetation processes and carbon assimilation. So one of the places we've been applying this model is in the California Sierra, which are semi-arid, but also snow dominated. And a question we've been interested in is, what's just simply the effect of warming, which causes two things in that region. One, things get warmer, the forests start using, turn on earlier, they potentially could use more water. But when things get warmer, the snow melts earlier. So you change the timing of recharge. You could think about a similar thing in a non-snow dominated system if the timing of when precipitation fell changed. So we want to look at how do those things play out against each other. And so I'm showing here just some estimates of changes in ET or, or forest water use largely um, with a three degree warming and showing that at some elevations and in some years you get increases but very often you get decreases in the amount of water that's available for, um, for these forests. And in this bar graph, I said, well, as you've heard me say several times, I think one of our big uncertainties in this type of modeling is what are our rooting depths or what are our soil water storage capacity? So I looked at uncertainty in the relationship between the amount of water, the timing of water, and the interaction of those and ET with soil uh, parameter uncertainty. And you can see that in those box plots there. Um, so 
in places like the Western US or in Israel, where you potentially have this strong um, co-evolution of vegetation and water patterns, it gives you a place where you can test these models more rigorously. Um, not just by comparing the model with stream flow, but we've also been comparing the model with, say, year-to-year -year estimates of model estimates of year-to-year -year variation in MPP with tree ring growth or looking at model estimates of vegetation patterns on the landscape with what we see from remote sensing, right? So we try to evaluate this model with multiple data sources. I think one of the most interesting ones is in the 2000s, there was a big ponderosa, pon ponderosa pine dieback in New Mexico. And most of the trees, the trees that died were all at the lowest elevations um, along an elevational gradient, whereas the ponderosa pines at the top, higher elevations were fine. So we used the model estimates of non-structural carbohydrate storage to say, well, how will those estimates compare with this mortality, the spatial pattern of mortality? And I'll go into details in for you in my poster, but what we found was the model did a nice job of predicting where we might expect those, tree to die, those trees to die and where they wouldn't. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Great. So uh, the poster I'm presenting is on the mechanistic modeling of the effectiveness of vegetation, tall vegetation, as a barrier to spread of wind-dispersed invasive species. And it's a collaborative work with Gabi Katul and with Tirta Banerjee. So as uh, Ranatan mentioned yesterday, we know that wind-dispersed species uh, cause substantial damages, like if it's invasive species or if it's just weeds, agricultural weeds, they can uh, cause substantial damages both to natural and agroecosystems. And we also know that usually preventing spread <coughs> of such species may be more efficient than trying to eradicate already established populations, yet specifically for wind dispersed species, uh, methods to contain them, contain the spread are currently very scarce. And it was suggested mainly in the weed science literature that maybe we can um, decrease the spread by generating tall vegetation buffers that will cause a decrease in the seed dispersal. And they actually tried to test this a little bit in wind tunnel experiments. But as we know, usually the spread of species is the, the spread rate is the mainly controlled by rare long distance dispersal events and such events are difficult to study uh, empirically. And therefore what we were looking for here is to construct a mechanistic modeling framework that will enable us to explore these questions. And on the other one hand, we want to be able to describe the wind flow over barriers as wind is the dispersal vector in enough detail. On the other hand, we still are looking for quite a simplified approach so that we can use this model to look at the seasonal and maybe even annual scales. And uh, so an LES wouldn't work for these questions. And uh, hence our approach was to apply a coupled Eulerian Lagrangian closure approach, which also Ran mentioned yesterday. And for seed dispersal originally, it was developed for a homogeneous vegetation. And here we are employing a newly developed a Eulerian model, a first order closure model, it was developed by Gabi and Tirta, and um, we use the outputs on the wind flow variables as inputs for modeling sea trajectories. So I will show you very preliminary results. So this is how, what uh, some of the wind variables look like. So you can see that uh, basically mean horizontal velocities are decreasing inside the, the barrier and also a little bit upstream of it and then increasing again. But then because of that, we also have suddenly um, an upward mean uh, component, which we don't have in homogeneous environments. And plus the turbulence is also very complex and especially we have increased turbulence at the entrance and the uh, exit from this uh, tall vegetation. And then we can ask, okay, what goes on here if the common logic is, you know, you have this decreased mean horizontal velocity, so that's why we hope that it can decrease dispersal. However, maybe the seeds are moving up and they're moving above this barrier. And if we also look at the turbulence, so it's really hard to predict what's going on, what we expect in such a system. And 
what I'm showing here is again very preliminary. This is just the special canals from one release point for one type of seeds, meaning terminal velocity and how high above the canopy we release it. And for this very specific situation, you can see that yes, if you're looking at what happens beyond the barrier, so we see that uh, there is, uh, are less seeds dispersed than uh, if we are not putting this buffer. And if you want to have a sense of some more of these results, like how the distance we are uh, releasing the seeds from affects the results, at what height, what kind of seeds, what, uh, how light or how heavy they are, what is the terminal velocity, so you're invited to see it at my poster. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so um, we talked um, several times already. We mentioned the regime shifts, and um, this is what uh, this work is about. Um, so I think yesterday we saw several times this kind of a graph in which we show a bistability of uh, two states. And uh, we say that um, close enough to this, to the edge of the bistability, a catastrophic regime shifts can occur. Um, and uh, in which uh, some big change in the system, the systems in this case would drop to a, a bare soil state, and um, this change will be irreversible and such. Um, but this is somewhat of a mean field view, especially the one I'm showing here. And we want to ask what happens when we include space into the thought process. And one of the things uh, we can talk about when we talk about uh, spatial systems is uh, pattern formation, uh, pattern vegetation. Um, we all saw many pictures of these uh, spots and uh, stripes and gaps along the rainfall gradient. You can see it. Actually, I take this off. It's nicer, and you can see it here on top. This kind of uh, gradient uh, of rain, and you see the different um, patterns. And uh, we focused on two areas here: one of uh, bare soil state and uh, and the uh, pattern state on the left, and to the right, that of uh, the pattern state and uh, uniform vegetation. And um, the idea here is basically that we can talk about uh, multi-stability of states that leads to uh, different dynamics. Um, so first of all, uh, as the bistability of patterns with bare soil, uh, we, we looked at uh, several models. We, couldn't, uh, we didn't find uh, any localized patterns or any um, non-regular patterns. And whenever we disturbed the system, it would only change its uh, characteristic uh, length scale. Um, but even more generally, in all the models we looked at, um, we didn't see any occurrence of a, um, of a bare soil state invading a pattern state. This brings up, up the question of, does this happen in nature, or maybe how do we model this more correctly, and such things. On the other hand, on the other side of things, um, we also looked at a, a bistability of patterns with a uniform vegetation. Here we see more complex uh, possible dynamics, we see all kinds of things that can occur, and among other things, we can try to explain uh, what recently um, is, recently there's been a paper published about dynamics of uh, uh, fairy circles in Africa, so-called birth and death, and we can try to explain these kind of dynamics and similar things uh, with this uh, understanding of how um, multi-stability of these localized states occur in these systems. And uh, you're all welcome to come talk with me about the poster. Thank you. Oi. Since I'm the last one, I will do it very, very short. The title of my poster is Utilizing a Stochastic Weather Generator to Predict the Effect of Climate Condition on Bermisa Tabaki Population Dynamics. So this uh, project combined between climate research and ecology. We'll start with uh, some background. Temperatures play a crucial role in development time of insects. So as we all know, according to the IPCC, temperature is expected to increase by a few Celsius degree till the end of the century. So the aim of the research was to predict the Mr. Tabaki population response to current climate condition and their forecast and change in two sites in Israel. To reach our goal, we had few objectives. First of all, we wanted to develop a stochastic weather generator that is based on synoptic data. Usually, weather generators are based on local data. We wanted to connect them to synoptic data. Then, to downscale, gener to downscale general circulation model, we used the ACAM-5 uh, model to predict local climate changes, and then to develop a model that predicts the Mr. Tabaki population response to climate conditions. The results, results just in, in uh, general, so uh, as expected, according to our downscaling method, under the, A1, under the A1B scenario, temperatures 
are expected to raise in about 2.5 degrees in average till the end of the century in Israel. And we predict that we have major changes in the Misa Tabaki population size, community structure, and seasonality of outbreaks. Thank you very much.